a raging rampage that showed the world how one man's frustration towards local agencies led to devastating consequences. The infamous fury of Marvin Heemeyer turned a once peaceful town in Colorado into a living nightmare. Piloting a makeshift tank, Marvin turned buildings into rubble and striked fear into the hearts of law enforcement officers. They were left powerless against the man-made monstrosity that was being controlled by the local welder. But it seemed like the events that transpired on June 4, 2004, had a deeper meaning. Marvin soon became a polarizing figure, dividing the public's opinion about him, leading to some calling him a martyr. But who was Marvin Heemeyer? And how did his rampage turn him into a local hero? And for the people that, that are out there that hear this, please pray for me. I believe that, that I'm doing the right thing. This is Killdozer. Born October 28, 1951 in South Dakota, Marvin had a pleasant childhood while living on the dairy farm his family owned. He was raised in a Christian household and was known for his friendly attitude towards everyone. Marvin had a passion for constructing planes, so during the 1970s, he decided to join the U.S. Air Force, where he dedicated his life to serving his country and fulfilling his desire for plane construction. While serving in the U.S. Air Force, Marvin was stationed at Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado. During his time in this new state, Marvin admired the beauty and wanted to settle down there whenever he got the opportunity. In 1989, after completing his service in the U.S. Air Force, Marvin decided to move to Grand Lake, Colorado, where he would then focus on starting a new life along with new business venture. With his newfound skills at his disposal, Marvin decided to open up a welding business, which in his mind would be the biggest welding shop in all of Colorado. But before opening the shop, he decided to buy a plot of land to build his business on. In 1992, in the hopes of buying property for his business, Marvin participated in an auction held by the Resolution Trust Corporation. During the auction, Marvin was able to outbid his opponents for two acres of land at a price of $45,000. With this newly purchased land, the dream of opening a welding company was soon going to come true. But little did he know that there were other players in the auction that were determined to take the same land by any means necessary. Right after purchasing the land, Marvin was confronted by a local businessman, Cody Dushev. Dushev had dreams of expanding his concrete manufacturing empire to new territories. Cody offered a sum of $60,000 to Marvin in exchange for the two acres of property. But Marvin refused the offer and bid Cody farewell. Little did he know that this businessman would eventually become his worst enemy. Soon after purchasing the land, Marvin was able to create his welding shop in a warehouse right next to it. He named his business Mountain View Mufflers. Marvin began enjoying his life by hanging out with his friends, snowmobiling in the winters and hot tubbing in his cabin, all while working hard and dedicating his time to making his welding business bigger than ever. According to relatives and his close friends, Marvin was the type of guy who would have gone the extra mile for anyone who was in need. But soon, Life was going to throw a wrench into Marvin's plans, pushing him to the very edge of his limits, eventually breaking the man himself. After a couple of months went by, Marvin was again confronted by Cody and Duchef. This time, Cody asked Marvin for how much money it would take for him to be willing to sell his land, to which Marvin replied with a price of $250,000. Cody accepted the price, but after observing Cody's eagerness towards buying the land, Marvin increased the cost to $350,000 and went even further, bumping the price up to a million dollars. Lack of seriousness from Marvin just made Cody dislike him even more, eventually pulling back the deal and leaving Marvin's property without saying a word. But it seemed like Dushev wasn't the only one that Marvin was making enemies out of. In 1992, Marvin realized that there were no signs of gambling in the local area of Grand Lake, so he advocated for the promotion of casinos in his hometown. Posting articles on a pro-gambling newspaper called the Grand Lake Gazette, promoting the financial benefits that gambling would provide to the town itself. Upon being notified of Marvin's stunts, Sky High News, a well-known newspaper provider, 
along with the Grand Lake Prospector, turned down Marvin's attempts to promote gambling in their hometown. But Marvin didn't back down so easily. He continued pushing his pro-gambling agenda during political campaigns, which resulted in him getting into heated arguments with sky-high reporters in the Grand Lake Prospector. Things only started going downhill as tensions between Marvin and the local authorities continued to grow due to zoning and sewage disputes. After purchasing the two acres of land, Marvin realized that it lacked the proper facilities to process sewage and started receiving letters from the sewage authority, notifying him that his property's sewage system was not up to code. As a means of fixing this problem, Marvin contacted the local sewer district and asked him to lay down new pipelines, but the task turned out to be much more demanding than Marvin had anticipated. As the local sewer authority informed Marvin that they were going to annex his property into the local sewer district, but Marvin had to put in a 100-foot sewer line and a lift station at his own expense. The cost of this whole operation turned out to be $70,000. This excluded electricity and maintenance costs. After realizing the cost that he had to bear, Marvin began developing hatred towards Gransby's local authorities and rejected the district's solution. In his perspective, this was an attempt by the local government to extort him of his money. After refusing to cooperate, Marvin began dumping his sewage water into an irrigation ditch that was located behind his property. This caused locals to file a complaint against Marvin for the illegal dumping of sewage water, provoking the district to enforce a fine of $2,500 on Marvin along with bombarding him with other city code violations. At this moment, Marvin was stuck between paying fines and looking for cheap alternatives to fix his sewage problem. Little did he know that his neighbors were conspiring against him on the sidelines. The Duchef family decided that if they couldn't have Marvin's land, then neither could he. And they began efforts to sabotage Marvin's business. They initiated their plan to construct a concrete batch plant southwest of Marvin's property. But in order to successfully implement their plan, they needed the public and the town board's member support. So, they held several town meetings, during which they convinced all concerned parties that the plant was going to follow all hazard procedures, making it dust and noise proof. During the hearings, Marvin continuously opposed the construction of the cement plant, as its construction had the potential of ruining his business and blocking customers' direct access to his shop, but no one listened. And on January 9, 2001, Marvin's worst nightmare came true. The Duchef's plant was unanimously approved by the town board members and the zoning commission. Even after the decision was made, Marvin kept on filing lawsuits against the Duchefs, but all of them were dismissed. Meanwhile, the construction of the concrete batch plant began without any delays and started to take its toll on Marvin's business. To pour salt in the wound, Sky High News began praising the plant's construction and its benefits for Gransby in their newspaper all while tarnishing Marvin's reputation and calling him out in their articles. The batch plant's construction restricted easy access for customers towards Marvin's shop, due to which Marvin's business started seeing a drastic decline. But Marvin was hopeful till the very end, as he decided to create a new road through his land, which would give his customers new access to his business. In order to create a new road, Marvin took a trip out to California, where he acquired a Komatsu D355A bulldozer through an auction and arranged for its transportation back to Gransby. After the purchase of the bulldozer, Marvin was hopeful that he could save his business and finally live a peaceful life. But it seemed like his dreams were short-lived as city officials rejected his plan to create an alternative route to his muffler shop. With broken hopes and dreams, Marvin began packing up shop and had the bulldozer on sale. Marvin had nowhere to go and no one to be around. He didn't have a wife to share his grief with, or children who would make him laugh in hard times. All he had were people who dragged him through the mud and ruined his reputation. With nothing but hatred in his heart, and a bulldozer outside his shop, Marvin took that as a sign from God to punish those who had done him wrong. Soon, giving birth to kill Dozer. Marvin, being left alone in his thoughts, turned out to be more dangerous than anyone could have anticipated. In his mind, members of the town board, the Duchef family, and the local news outlets had interfered with his business and ruined his life. Marvin was given a new purpose and promised to enact revenge on the people who were responsible for his downfall. After Marvin was unable to sell the bulldozer, he decided to put it to use for something much more sinister. 
He came up with a plan to modify his bulldozer into a weapon of mass destruction, capable of turning buildings into rubble and being indestructible. To construct this monstrosity, Marvin needed money and a quiet place to work. In order to do so, he sold his property for $420,000 to the trash company and took out a lease for half the building he previously owned, telling the new landowners he was going to be on the premises until he finished some work. After obtaining the money for the bulldozer modifications, Marvin erected a wall to separate his space from the rest of the building and changed the locks, making sure no one interfered with his project. He began creating blueprints of the vehicle, which helped him make modifications according to his needs. He later gathered resources from local automotive dealers, scrapyards, and hardware stores that were going to aid him in his mission. Marvin's first objective was to make the vehicle durable to bullets and explosives, for which he constructed an exterior armor shell that consisted of 5,000 psi of concrete mixed sandwiched between sheets of steel. In the end, the composite armor around the bulldozer was one foot thick, which covered the engine and the whole upper exterior of the bulldozer. After completing the exterior of the killdozer, the second objective was to develop an interior of the vehicle, mainly focusing on visibility and self-defense. In order to see the outside world clearly from the killdozer, Marvin fitted the bulldozer with several video cameras that would link the two monitors mounted on the vehicle's dashboard. Marvin made sure that the cameras were protected on the outside by equipping them with three-inch shields of clear bulletproof lexic, making it difficult for any officer to take down the cameras with a standard handgun. Along with that, compressed air nozzles were fitted to blow dust away from the video camera. In order to prevent heat exhaustion during driving, Marvin installed onboard fans and an air conditioner. For self-defense, he had made three gun ports fitted with a 50 caliber rifle, a 308 caliber semi-automatic rifle, and a 22 caliber rifle, all fitted with a half-inch steel plate, giving him multiple angles to shoot targets from all sides. After a year and a half went by, the killdozer was finally constructed and ready to wreak havoc on anything that stood in its way. During the construction of the killdozer, Marvin was consumed by the hatred he felt against the people of Granby. So much so that he created a handwritten list that consisted of 107 people that he wanted to exact revenge upon. And on top of that list was none other than the Duchef family, the very first ones to contribute to his suffering. When everything was set and all preparations were made, it was time for Marvin to conclude his story and express his grievance one last time. He began making audio recordings in his tape recorder and explained his motivations, saying that it was God who blessed him to do this task and that it's a burden that only he will carry by himself. It was above me. It wasn't me. I was doing this because God wanted me to do it. And now God had prepared me to carry this cross I believe so. And I'm carrying the cross willingly now. On May 22nd, 2004, Marvin made his final recording and left handwritten notes that stated, I was always willing to be reasonable until I had to be unreasonable. Sometimes reasonable men must do unreasonable things. Before going out on his rampage, Marvin sent the audio recordings to his brother and carried three handguns in the killdozer knowing that as soon as he closed the hatch, there would be no going back, and this vehicle would be his coffin. The day Marvin anticipated for so many years finally came. On June 4, 2004, he started his rampage on the town. With clear targets on his mind, Marvin drove the vehicle straight through the walls of the shop where he kept it hidden from the public. The first target that Marvin pursued was Dochef's concrete plant. During the time of the rampage, Cody Dochef was located at the plant doing top soil screening. Little did he know that a 100-ton behemoth was charging towards him with full force. Marvin drove the killdozer straight through the plant and started to bring the building down. After seeing the vehicle cause damage to the plant, Cody got into a front-end loader and charged head-on towards the killdozer. As the two vehicles clashed, Marvin saw an opportunity to shoot Cody with one of his rifles. Cody got out of the front end loader and took cover as Marvin fired his 50 caliber rifles towards him. But Cody had vengeance on his mind as well, as he got on a scrapper and again tried stopping Marvin by colliding head on. However, Cody was unsuccessful in stopping Marvin 
as his scrapper was pushed aside by the killdozer. After causing significant damage to the concrete plant, Marvin moved on towards his next target, the Sky High News Office, where his reputation was tarnished and his opinions were mocked in their newspaper. But before reaching the news outlet's office, Marvin was confronted by the local law enforcement, who began firing at the vehicle in high volume. But it seemed the vehicle was taking little to no damage and continued to carry out its mission of mass destruction. Marvin stood resilient, not allowing anything to stand in his way of vengeance, as he fired at the officers along with their patrol vehicles, all while driving towards the buildings that consisted of the people he despised. During the rampage, the police were successfully able to evacuate the civilians from Granby and called in backup to stop the beast that was tearing its way through the buildings like paper. When law enforcement agencies proved to be powerless against Marvin, Governor Bill Owens considered authorizing the National Guard to use either an Apache attack helicopter equipped with a Hellfire missile or a two-man fire team equipped with a Javelin anti-tank missile to destroy the bulldozer. But the governor went against the decision as it may have caused more damage to the surrounding area. The rage-filled rampage lasted two hours and seven minutes, during which Marvin was able to damage 12 buildings that belonged to the people he had on his list. However, it wasn't until the 13th building that his rampage would soon come to a screeching halt. As Marvin surged from one building to the next, he realized that one of the town board members owned a gambling hardware store. So without hesitation, he charged in the direction of the store and began destroying its structure. But this only caused more problems for Marvin as the killdozer's radiator was damaged during the rampage. This caused various fluids to leak out of the vehicle, but this was only a minor inconvenience to Marvin as he continued decimating the building. While ramming his vehicle into the hardware store, things took a turn for the worse. As one of the vehicle's threads got stuck in the base of the store, rendering the vehicle immobile. Upon realizing he had no escape, Marvin took his own life, shooting himself in the head with one of his handguns. Law enforcement officers later use a cutting torch to cut through the kill dozer's steel plates and remove Marvin's body from the dozer. The town of Granby took a large sigh of relief as the nightmare of the kill dozer had finally ended. Marvin Hemeyer was behind the wheel during a 90-minute rampage in that fortified building. It's something like you'd see on TV. You know, it's hard to believe. This is video from Sky 9. It shows where the armored bulldozer ended up stuck inside a warehouse-type building. 15 buildings were damaged or destroyed, including the town hall, the library, and the newspaper building. They all appear to be connected to this dispute. It has been going on for some time, and a lot of people knew about it. But no one expected something like this to happen yesterday. There were no reported casualties during the kill dozer rampage except for Marvin himself. The cost of the damages caused by the rampage exceeded $7 million. The story gained traction and awareness from all over the U.S. Once the information became public, many people started to take Marvin's side, with many justifying his actions by saying that he was just a regular man who wanted to make an honest living but was pushed to the edge by the town's corrupted system. The story of Killdozer made Marvin a martyr for many people. The dismantling of Marvin's bulldozer for scrap metal was declared on April 19, 2005, in order to prevent the Killdozer's enthusiasts from obtaining mementos. The case of the Killdozer turned Marvin Hemeyer into a polarizing figure, with people turning his action into a political matter and rationalizing them as justified and fitting in proportion. After a deep dive into the history of Marvin Hemeyer, we're left to wonder, was Marvin a victim of a corrupted system? And how would things have turned out if he was allowed to build the alternative route towards his muffler shop? <laughs>